Hello, and welcome to Heart Senses The Pulse, where we tackle pressing issues in healthcare. Today, we will discuss the effects of artificial intelligence technology on the primary care physicians and the cardiologists with our co-founder, Dr. Antoine Keller, and our special guests for today, Dr. Garland Green, structural heart interventionalist, and Dr. Ronnie Whitfield, primary care physician with special interest in cardiovascular disease. Doctors Keller, Green, and Whitfield, welcome, and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for, thank you. You for having us, Sabrina. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm looking forward to this chat. I know that there is a strong relationship between the primary care physician and the cardiologist, but we would just really like to know how, you know, this is all changing with artificial intelligence. So, um, oh. Yeah. Well, both yes. of you have been in practice for 10 years or so, perhaps a little bit longer, and you have seen a lot of changes in the cardiovascular space over those years, specifically in the last five years. So it seems like the technology has just exploded in cardiovascular disease diagnosis. And so we really want to know about your thoughts about how that technology has changed your practice over the year and what you feel about what the future holds for that kind of technology and, and diagnosis, specifically as it relates to um, uh, early diagnosis and early intervention and appropriate use of, uh, of the technology. Yes. Uh, yeah, you want me to start, Doc, or how we have- Please, go ahead, uh, give me your thoughts. Well, you know, it started off with the electronic medical records. And um, so, you know, being able to document things and communicate with physicians online. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I have to tell you, Sabrina, up front that, that these are not just colleagues, but friends of mine. So we have a, a text group that's unrelated to medicine in many <laughs> cases, but they're also very accessible. So when I need them, unfortunately, I have their number. So I got to get a patient in ASAP. I'm able to text um, my buddies and, and, and call or send the messages through electronic medical records so that we can communicate about these patients. Um, but wow. artificial intelligence has really changed the way that I practice, especially when doing screenings and working out in the community because I can get information that I normally wouldn't be able to obtain and then I'm able to refer these patients in, a, in not only a prompt manner, but sometimes in, in an in urgent manner to get them the care that they need. So it's been wonderful for me. Uh, again, changed the way that I practice and really increase the communication relationship that I have with my cardiovascular specialist. So I'm, I'm excited about the technology and I think it only gets better from here. It's learning and mastering the things. I wish I had that stethoscope, however, when I was in, in, um, in residency so I could have cheated through my, my clinical. <laughs> 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 Dr. Green, would you like to add anything? Or excuse me, Dr. Whitfield, were you still? Continue. Oh, no, no. You, uh, you know, I got that was my point. So, yeah, again, just really increased access to care for my patients, communication with my cardiovascular specialists, and just, you know, even improving my technical skills. Sometimes you're questioned upon that murmur that you're hearing. Artificial intelligence has helped me to, to say, hey, there is something going on here. Wow, that's great. So yeah. for the EMR and for the um, stethoscope for that AI technology you're using, Dr. Green, uh, would you like to add anything from the perspective of the, the cardiologist? I, I, I do, and I think that uh, piggybacking on what he was saying, I think that uh, early detection is really one of the best resources we have for dealing with these patients. Oftentimes, uh, what we, we found is that the patients present so late, usually during the admission to the hospital where they're already so sick that oftentimes they're too, too far gone for us to make much difference in their lives. This type of technology gives confidence, I think, to a primary care and even to some cardiologists to confirm that what they think they hear, they are hearing. Get real time, you know, real diagnostic value and then be able to really expedite those processes. You know, sometimes we've had a lot of health fairs and, you know, they come kind of go and you, you do these things and you, you know, you question how much are you helping because you know, how much are you really testing? What are you really looking for? Uh, do mm -hmm. folks really analyze these things? But with AI, it puts a light directly on what you're trying to identify. And then you can specifically identify that particular patient group, and then you can get those people to where they need to be. So I think these are opening up you know, great opportunities for us, especially as we have more ways, like Dr. Keller mentioned, to treat these diseases. But it's only useful if the patient's not dead, 
or near dead <laughs> by the time. Oh, goodness. <laughs> you know, and I mean, <laughs> not to be, be so blunt, but that's the truth. You know, we don't it want is. them to come in already dead. We want them to come in with enough life left that we can try to preserve it and make it more valuable to them. And Sabrina, I'll, I'll yeah. be quite honest with you. I have had the technology in the office, given my patient the phone so they can hold the phone and see me recording their heartbeats. And I've gotten a couple of, you know, so they're participating in their care. They're engaged. Like, hey, Doc, what you doing? I'm a gadget guy, so I always got weird stuff. But this time, this could actually save your life. And I've called Dr. Green or Dr. Keller and said, I'm about to text you this 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 EKG that I just got on this on, on my technology. And they're like, send that patient right now. So, you know, Dr. Green That's may have said that tongue in cheek, but we seriously are able to save lives and get folks access to care. When at some points we may have been unsure, hey, we're going to refer to cardiology next week. And that could have been a travesty, whereas now, like, like, hey, no, I need to see that patient today. So really, mm -hmm. really cool stuff, man. Really cool stuff. Wow. Oh, my gosh. That's that's amazing. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. that early detection can really happen. And then yeah. that really ties into, you know, the patient relationship to the primary care physician and to the cardiologist, because you're all already kind of having this conversation at once. Well, exactly. you still have the patient in the room. So that's, Correct. wow, that's amazing. What would you say to someone who was on the fence about whether to use technology in their practice like this or not use technology in their practice? What would you say uh, to uh, either uh, to sway them with regard to whether they should have it or not? Or do you think that's even... Uh, an issue. You think everybody's pretty much bought into the technology and there are no holdouts. Doc, you want it first or me? I, I got some thoughts on that one. Well, <laughs> I think I, I think with uh with with what uh, Dr. Whitfield just said, you know, um the 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 real time being able to get buy-in from a patient is often the struggle because sometimes they will send a patient. And then Dr. Whitfield was like, oh, man, I'm sending you a patient. Now I'll get the patient signed up and I might not see that patient. And I say, man, the patient never showed up. It's because the patient doesn't have buy-in. But now mm -hmm. with this type of technology, you as a pr practitioner can come in and say, listen, listen, you can listen to it yourself. You know, when I have my stethoscope and I'm listening, they have to believe what I say and, and to trust that I know what I'm talking about and will have confidence in me. But when you've got this sort of technology right there, you can say, listen, you want to hear your own murmur. Look, you want to see it on this graph right here. This is what the murmur looks like. This is what's important. And this is what we need to treat. And they can see it and make, you know, they don't have to have a lot of clinical knowledge to see there's a problem. And right. once you get that, they get sufficiently, um, mm -hmm. you know, agitated, <laughs> should, should I say, or or, yeah. or 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 scared enough. Concerned, people, right. Absolutely. So it really helps with compliance and making sure those patients have buy-in to what's going on with them. So I think for a practitioner, that's what you're always striving to get, is for patients to believe what you say, to have fidelity in the relationship between doctor and patient. So to me, the biggest selling point is you can get your patients involved and engaged with what their own diagnoses are, and you have more confidence doing it as well. So I think that would, to me, would be a big selling point for, for a lot of primary care docs to get them off the fence if they are, if they are on it. That's a great mm. point. I think, Sabrina, honestly, that uh, if you're not doing this, you're, you, it's kind of like what they used to say about, I hate to use this analogy, guys, but <laughs> steroids, if you're not using it in sports, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> bad, bad, bad analogy, guys, bad analogy, but it's true. If you're not using artificial intelligence in your practice and have access to it, you're not trying hard enough. Uh, and you're, you're kind of behind eight balls. Same thing with electronic medical records. Some of my older colleagues have been very resistant to using EMR, and that's that's where we're heading in medicine. With COVID now, a lot of folks are probably going to get mailed in a couple of years a, a stethoscope, um, a, a thermometer, and a blood pressure cuff so they can do things at home in case we ever have a pandemic that none of us, including Dr. Keller and Dr. Dr. Green, probably thought we'd ever see in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. But we have this pandemic that's now, you know, forced us to kind of practice from home. And so you can do things from home still. So imagine, imagine that, that, that episode, Sabrina, where you're having some chest discomfort. You got a septoscope at home, you can place your heart. Dr. Keller's at his house, say, that's not good, Sabrina. We got to get EMS to you right away. Wow. Yeah. You know, so if you're not, if, you, if you're not on, on board as a patient, I can handle the patient. I think the problem, Dr. Keller and Dr. Green, is the physicians who don't want to jump on board. Uh, this is the, this is the way medicine is heading now. And I think we just, we just got to, we got to embrace it and move forward. 
So I got a question for you. You know, I'm a surgeon and I remember during my two month rotation on internal medicine, my physical diagnosis professor always used to tell me there's no substitute for touching the patient. Yes. Patients come to the doctor because they want you to lay your hands on them. For patients, there's no way that you can get as much information from talking to a patient on the phone. And we didn't have internet back then, but uh, mm -hmm. as you can from being right there in front of them. So right. what do you say to those people that say, no, um, all of this te telemedicine and, and digital technology where you don't have to be there and you're not in front of the patient, it's just not going to ever take off because the patients want to see their doctor face to face. What? We're not losing that relationship. I'm saying in the midst of a pandemic, but with the artificial technology that we're currently using, you're still in the physical, there's physical contact. 80% of the diagnosis is from the discussion that we have with the patient. That's what we were talking about mm -hmm. Dr. Keller in school. So if you're in my office, I'm still touching you, holding your hand, crying with you when I need to. But that stethoscope's on your chest. I'm touching you. But I have enhanced abilities now. I have my superpowers in my hand now. I got no, I'm referring, yeah, I understand that, but I'm like, the, you said people are going to get their stethoscope in the mail, they're going to put it on their chest, and this is where we're going. Um, whether we want to admit it or believe it or understand that this is where it's going or not, more and more of our job is going to be done remotely. Well, again, I, I just think that's the, there's no answer to that other than this is where we're going. And so mm -hmm. folks will eventually jump on board with the concept, they're going to have to. And so I, I don't think we can, can convince them otherwise. I think the so, person, the physician, doing what you're doing right now, educating the community on the fact that this is where we're heading instead of this being a surprise. I don't think it's going to mm -hmm. happen tomorrow, but I am doing much more video visits, especially with some of my non-complicated patients for medication refills, just to check in, doc. You mm -hmm. know, I can do those visits and do them a little bit more efficiently and faster. Uh, I see. So mm -hmm. I, I think the conversation is just going to have to continue to happen. And, and, and eventually, so, you know, I'm not sure Green agrees with that. But they're they're going to have to get on board. I think that's yeah. where we're headed. It's, 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 it's a good point that most things can be done remotely. But when you need to be in front of a patient, you can get in front of a patient. So Dr. Wagner patient. wasn't totally wrong. And that still counts. Well, well what, uh, what I would tell you, but I think the two things go together. Because yeah. mm -hmm. what, what, you're, what you're saying is, my biggest problem with COVID and having doing telemedicine and things like that is I can't listen to the heart. As a cardiologist, if I can't listen to the heart, what am I really doing? You know, so, so, so what, what this technology enables me to do is you have somebody at home that has access to that. They can then give me that diagnostic capability like I'm touching them. In right. a sense of now I can see what your heart sounds like. I can see what your murmur is. I can facilitate that process. And I'm actually doing what Dr. Wagner said. I'm still contacting the patient. I'm just extending my hands digitally. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I think that selling point may have been difficult, you know, for this population we're dealing with right now as far as baby boomers, but the populations that are coming, this is not going to be a foreign concept to them because they've grown sure. up in a COVID age. They've grown up with technology. They've grown up with technology involved in everything that we do. Right. I think mm -hmm. it's only going to enhance what we do, not hinder. And, you know, because I can do an echo now, doesn't mean I don't still listen to the heart. You see, those mm -hmm. things don't, they, they, they complement each other. They confirm each other, you know? So I think that we, we, we have to embrace technology for what it is. Does anybody doubt that we need to? You know, I used to have a, 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 a I mean, one of my professors who thought he could diagnose everything with just a physical exam. Yeah. Right? And so as a result, he, he um, you know, he would get upset, you know, why you order an echo? I already know. And then if the echo didn't agree with him, oh, no, it's no way. It can't be. <laughs> you know, and, and so it was, it was one of those situations where he had to embrace that times were changing. And, you know, that ultrasound had a little bit better eyes and ears than he did. And so, uh, you know, over time, we all change. So I don't think it's going to be as much of a fight from that perspective. I think, you know, as we continue to go into this technological age, which there is no going back, yeah. that folks will have to embrace it because it's here and understand mm -hmm. how to help it help you. You don't want to be the guy, like Dr. Whipple is pointing out, that can't do that. If you're the guy that can't extend those services to folks at home, then you will get left behind, uh, you know, by the whole field. So you cannot do that. Any, I mean, that's not even an option anymore. You know, right. I hate to say it, but it's just yeah. the truth. It's not an option. Whether you look, really I, I, don't wanna, I don't want to drag the point out, but this is the this is the era of Uber, uh, DoorDash, mm -hmm. Airbnb, 
folks want convenience, they want it right now, they want accessibility, so yeah. artificial intelligence. I mean, mm-hmm. this is where we're going. I, I don't I don't right. think there's going to be as much resistance as, as some folks think when this really hits hard, but it's already here, it's already happening. Um, it's amazing some of the stuff that you can do, and I'm supposed mm-hmm. to be one of the, the I'm the hip hop dog. I'm on the cutting edge. <laughs> these these kids are leap years ahead. We have a young student on our on our board at Southern University, and they the things they come up with, and the things, the concepts that they want to use, are amazing, and they all are related in some sense or form to artificial intelligence. So I think mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. think it's going to be that difficult, and I think the pandemic. I always tell people if you came on this pandemic and you're not better, you're not financially better, spiritually better. You didn't do something right because we had time to yeah. to to intro to to reflect and think, and so I think the pandemic helped us realize that there there may be another way to do this and still help our patients. We're going to still touch and feel, but if there's an opportunity or, or a lack of an opportunity to do that, we can still take care of that patient. Absolutely. Wow! Oh my goodness, that is really cool to hear these different perspectives and to kind of just get to the bottom line that it's the future and this is what's going to happen. And there's even studies that have been done um, that were conducted back in 2020. So I think even pre-pandemic, I want to say that the AI powered algorithms were going to start really being part of primary care and healthcare in general, but that was before the pandemic and now it's just exploded. So Mm -hmm. it's definitely going to be part of the future of healthcare if you know more so than it is right now so um that brings me to another question so um we've talked about the relationship with the patient and the primary care doctor and the cardiologist and um that kind of ties into the referral process though i'm curious how much has that changed pre-pandemic versus now that you're referring um, from the primary care to a cardiologist or another specialist for treatment for a patient? I'm Sabrina, I'm blessed to have these two guys as friends and colleagues. So it hasn't changed much for me other than there's probably more coming. Uh, and from the artificial intelligence component, I'm able to pick up things that I was unsure about. In, in the past, I would just refer because I didn't know, or I wasn't sure. Now I can refer with confidence. I can refer quicker and I also have more information when I'm referring. So I feel like I'm helping my, my colleagues process quicker. I mean, today people want a, a lot more information when you show up. So you're not just show, show up with, mm-hmm. I think I have a murmur and then sometimes I send folks and it's wrong. So that kind of hurts the credibility of the doctor. I've literally called Dr. Keller or, or, or Dr. Green in front of the patient. Like, hey, I just got this information. <laughs> I need you to see this patient. And it's yeah. really cool, not only that they see that I have relations with them, but I also have information that they're going to be able to use to help them. Mm-hmm. And so for me personally, it, it hasn't changed. But I think for other doctors, the, the referral is going to increase because they're going to pick more uh, bad news up or at least things that are questionable. Now they're going to actually know, hey, this is a aortic stenosis or mitral regurg that sounds like it's gotten worse in the last couple of years. It wasn't sure mm-hmm. before, but they'll mm-hmm. have more information. Yes, and ma'am. Dr. Green, do you think that the time frame between the time that the patient has their initial diagnosis or suspected diagnosis to the time they ultimately get treatment has been lessened with the uh, introduction of artificial intelligence and technology? I think definitely the answer would be yes on that because the truth is we're, especially with some of the things we do, I know we may touch on and you know, the things we do with heart stenting, we're going out and finding people that probably wouldn't have been found at all until they got sick. So the answer mm-hmm. is yes, definitely. Because most of the people we see are asymptomatic at that time. And 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 so or not knowing what their symptoms are. And right. so 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 what you do is you're introducing people into the healthcare system that might not have been there before. And so yeah. yes, I do think when people get more confident in murmurs, you know, I remember when I was in bed, because since we reminisce about that time. One of the things that pushed me toward cardiology was that I had a comfort level with it when most of my colleagues didn't. Mm -hmm. Most people aren't comfortable with diagnosing murmurs. Most people aren't comfortable with EKGs. Most people aren't aren't comfortable with doing those things, you know, on their own. Um, Mm -hmm. So it it is definitely sped up the process of people getting in. I'll tell you, one of the biggest AI, you know, things besides what you guys are doing is talking about just the, the Apple Watch. The Apple Watch has been a a dynamo 
as far as early referral because people look at their heart rate <laughs> and say, oh, it tells them something's not right. Mm -hmm. Your heart rate's irregular. They come into the, they, they're, they're calling to make an appointment and say, what's going on? Well, my watch told me that this was going on, that that was going on. And they have no EKG. And so those things are really pushing folks to come in earlier than they would. Because listen, we've seen youngsters, 20 year olds, 30 year olds that are coming in, you know, may, may have had AFib, you know, atrial fibrillation for years and didn't know it, but the watch picked it up. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and we all know that there are a lot of, you know, complications that go along with that, you know, and at some point I know we're going to do our discussion on atrial fibrillation, but we'll table that for another time. But it's very important to find that early before the person comes yeah. with a stroke or, or, or some other abnormality. So I think that, uh, yes, the, 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 the AI is really pushing things much earlier in the paradigm. Yeah, and I, you know, I have two thoughts on that. One that, you know, you mentioned heart sense, and one of the, the valuable things is that we catch people with valvular heart disease before they have that index admission for heart failure. Correct. And that is uh, very significant because by the time the patients develop heart failure symptoms, oftentimes they have irreversible damage to their heart. So it's really important to be able to pick up things. And, and I will be honest, most of the things that we pick up with our heart sense screening don't necessarily need procedural intervention at the time that we pick them up. But uh, because of the fact that we know them, we save people's lives because they can have those things followed up upon at a regular interval by somebody who has uh, a lot of expertise in, in heart disease, atrial fibrillation, and structural heart disease like you. And it puts them on the radar, and it could potentially save their life uh, and, and give them more years to live because there's a lot of evidence that shows that if you can intervene upon someone before they develop heart failure, then their life expectancy is improved over uh, if they present after they have uh, uh, the heart failure. And the other thing I think that is really important with the advent of technology like transcatheter aortic valve replacement, which obviously you're an expert in that process as well, that we can, uh, it, it, when as a surgeon, whenever someone was found to have aortic stenosis and they were sent to me, if they were presumed to be asymptomatic, it was really hard for me to convince them sometimes to have their chest cracked open and to uh, undergo an operation that is life-threatening that's going to take them six or eight weeks to recover from. But now with the advent of transcatheter aortic valve technology, it's a little bit easier to convince people that think that they're asymptomatic to have the procedure because of the fact that they don't have to have a sternotomy and don't have to have the long recovery that's associated with major surgery. I agree. Yeah, um, we've kind of blown through all the questions that we had for today. Um, I guess the last point is going back to HeartSense and when you are there volunteering in yeah. person with those community members, what has that experience been like? And um, we'll start with Dr. Whitfield. Uh, a godsend for me. I mean, I enjoy, I'm, I'm, I'm known as a hip hop doctor, but I don't know if you know that I use music and medicine to educate kids on health issues. So all my life, I've done things, but being in medicine and able to really contribute to folks' health has been a mission and a passion for me. So now I'm with two really great guys, um, great staff when we do these heart sense events, but to be able to truly get information, and I do a lot of cardiovascular screening and athletes. I'm, I'm a sports medicine trained physician as well. So to have that information now and can get these guys to, 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 to Dr. Garden Green to manage their blood pressures and, and murmurs, and then if it happens that they got to see Dr. Keller, which, and I say it jokingly whenever I talk, but I mean, you got to think about it. When they're seeing Dr. Keller, in most cases, it's pretty serious. And yes. so, um, but if we can save someone's life by getting to Dr. Keller in time, salvage an opportunity for these young people to be able to play sports again, or again, saving someone's mother's life, these heart sense events have been very, very helpful. And we've picked up things that uh, have been missed by other primary care physicians, probably not because of a lack of education or abilities, but because of a lack of technology. And that's where the artificial intelligence plays a huge role. So yeah, I mean, for us to all work together and truly be able to see, like Dr. Green said earlier, to impact lives and save folks' lives, it's, it's, that's what we signed up for. And that's what we're doing. You know, today when I was preparing for this uh, pulse recording, I thought back to that very first cocktail meeting we had at the Renaissance at the hotel. hotel when we started talking about heart sense. 
And we've right. come a long way since then. Uh, <laughs> did, did I have a cocktail? I don't think I had a cocktail. Pandemic. I had fresh water. That's what I had some alkaline water. <laughs> fresh water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was, uh, we've come a long way. And I really appreciate the support and guidance and advice you all have given to me uh, as we have taken this journey together. It has really been a godsend for me. And I, I value it more than you will know. Thank you, Doc. I appreciate it. There's nothing more rewarding to me than getting out into the community and participating in events like that. I think the uh, rewarding aspect of the gratitude that you get from the people uh, to me is, is no measure. I don't care how much I get paid in the office, going, doing those things and getting that gratitude is much more valuable to me. And I just I wish I had more time to do it. But to be able to get and touch people early on and kind of catch things and, 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 and help to push them along that, um, um, uh, down that road toward getting some recovery or like Dr. Keller said, to get in the way of some of those things that may come. And what I, what I always like to stress is what these things allow us to do is we can, I usually don't deal too much in a talk about longevity. And I say that in a, in a tongue in cheek kind of way in the sense of, my focus is to make your living here as good as it can be for as long as it can be. Because being here and being short of breath because you're in heart failure or, or taking 25 different medicines because things that are complications of atrial, uh, of, of, of uh, valvular heart disease have caused you to become so sick and so debilitated. Uh, it's not even about the valve anymore. By the time you get to the valve replacement, you may have had so many other issues that resulted from that. So mm -hmm. my concept is how do we improve the quality of life for the people that we seek to, uh, uh, to treat? Mm. And that is catching them early before all of these things happen. What they always say about an ounce of prevention, <laughs> you know, is, is always <laughs> better than a pound of cure because, you know, we can't always fix all of these things. Um, mm -hmm. We can't always, you know, bring them back from where they are. So my concept is let's get in as early as we can. Look for those things that uh, can be, uh, you know, kind of run with those things. You know, kind of like wh who, who do I run with as a, a as a, a cardiologist? I run with a primary care doctor and I run with a surgeon. What does <laughs> valvular heart disease run? Oh, it runs with electrical problems of the heart. You know, it runs with other structural problems of the heart. And we need to be, be sure that we get those running mates in check too. And so this is our way to get a little peek inside the window in, of that house that we call the heart. And, um, and, and I think that that's what I, I, I enjoy about these things is it enables us to do the very thing that we seek to do, which is help people feel better for as long as they can. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, my goodness. And that also segues into um, our next screening event is happening September 24th, the Saturday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Gloryland Sanctuary. And Dr. Green is a really strong proponent of us being at that venue. So thank you so much for the opportunity, Dr. Green. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you so much for this wonderful chat for the Pulse and learning more about artificial intelligence and wow I really didn't realize like how much of an impact this is having on the patients and the referral process and just the whole community in within healthcare so this was really um eye-opening thank you so much no thank you thank you for having me thank you guys great right. job okay.